Stand with me, please, as we honor the reading of the Lord's Word, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18. I want to begin in verse 35 and read to verse 43. I'm reading from the Message Bible. I want you to pray for the members in our church who are going through periods uh, of sickness. Sister Dwan Rutledge is in the hospital this morning, and our prayers are with her that the Lord will continue uh, to add uh, great grace and great comfort to her. Uh, as he continues to provide healing uh, in her body. Gospel of Luke chapter 18 verse 35 uh, through verse 43. I want to read these verses together. I'm reading again from uh, the Message Bible. Luke chapter 18 verse 35 through verse 43. Let's read these verses together. He came to the outskirts of Jericho. Oh, y'all have the message by? Oh, I think that's something different, Brother Josh, from message. He got it. Don't worry. He got it. Josh is a bad man. Bad. Oh, y'all thought it was me that was wrong. Oh. <laughs> See that, Josh? They, they got so much faith and trust in you. They thought it was me. I receive it in Jesus' name. I'm glad y'all love me and y'all love Josh. This morning, y'all love Josh more than you love me. That's all. That's, that's, that's cool. That's cool. I feel it. I'm feeling the love. I'm feeling the love. I'm feeling the love. I'm feeling the love. All right, let me read mine. He came to the outskirts of Jericho. He came to the outskirts of Jericho. <laughs> A blind man was sitting beside the road. A blind man was sitting beside the road. Asking for hand. Asking. All right, all right, all right. You're on the same page. Let's read together. Luke's Gospel, chapter 18, verse 35, uh, down through verse 43. Let's read together. He came to the outskirts of Jericho. A blind man was sitting beside the road asking for handouts. When he heard the rustle of the crowd, he asked what was going on. They told him, Jesus the Nazarene is going by. Now watch this. Watch verse 38. Hey, uh, Josh, go back to verse 37. The man heard the rustling of the crowd, and he asked them what was going on. What did they tell him in verse 38? Verse 37. They told him in verse 30, uh, 37, what? Jesus the Nazarene is going by. That's what they, he asked. He blind now. He couldn't see who it was. He heard the noise of the crowd. He said, tell me what's going on. They responded, Jesus the Nazarene is going by. Let's read verse 38. He yelled, Jesus Oh, I'm preaching already. I'm preaching already. I'm preaching already. Where did he get that from? They say at Deacon Clark that it was Jesus the Nazarene. The blind man didn't call him Jesus the Nazarene. The blind man said, Jesus, son of David, mercy, have mercy on me. I'll come back to that in a minute. Ooh, I'm getting full already. And I ain't even took the lids off the pot. No, already. Uh, get, getting full. Watch, watch verse 39. I wonder if you would have been a part of verse 39. Those ahead of Jesus told a man to shut up, but he only yelled all the louder, Son of David, mercy, have mercy on me. Verse 40. Jesus stopped and ordered him to be brought over. That's why you need to learn how to keep on yelling. Because if you yell loud enough, wherever Jesus was on his way to, he'll stop. Okay, all right, y'all. Uh, uh, uh. Jesus stopped. Now the people told the man to shut up. The more they told him to shut up, the louder he shouted. And he shouted so loud until he caught Jesus' attention. Jesus stopped and ordered him to be brought over. When he had come near, Jesus asked. What did Jesus ask? Verse 41. What do you want from me? He said, Master, I want to see again. Verse 
42, Jesus said, go ahead, see again. Your faith has saved and healed you. Watch verse 43. The healing was instant. He looked up seeing. Mm. Bro, John, a whole lot of us, the moment we would have gotten our sight, we would have went to the club. We would have went back home. We went to the crab man. We went to the weed man. <laughs> Y'all so deep. I have a keen sense of smell and a keen sense of discernment. I can smell somebody all the way at home in their living room. Saying, Pastor, that's probably where I would have went. That's right. <laughs> Y'all ain't come to our church. The healing was instant. He looked up seeing and then followed Jesus, glorifying God. Everyone in the street joined in, shouting praise to God. Go back to verse 38. Because again in verse 37, they told a man that it is Jesus the Nazarene. But watch what the man says in verse 38. He yelled, Jesus, son of David, mercy, have mercy on me. I want you to look up toward heaven and shout, Lord, Lord have, mercy. have mercy. One more time, Lord, Lord have, mercy. have mercy. Give me one more time, Lord, Lord have mercy. Have mercy. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in Jesus' name. That's what I want to talk about this morning, Lord, have mercy mercy. This miracle that we are learning about in Luke chapter 18 is also recorded in Matthew chapter 20 and in Mark chapter 10. To fully understand this miracle, you can't simply read it in one of these gospel records. You really need to read it in all three. You need to read it in Luke 18 you need to read it in Matthew 20, and you need to read it in Mark chapter 10. Ironically, Matthew mentions some details about this miracle that neither Mark nor Luke record. It's a very important detail uh, that Mark mentions in Mark's gospel chapter 10. Uh, in Mark's gospel chapter 10, Mark reveals, or it, well, actually, it, Mark tells us some stuff that neither Matthew or Luke talk about. Matthew also tells us some things uh, that the others do not reveal to us. Uh, what, what Matthew tells us about this uh, miracle, Sister Williams, is that it wasn't one man who was visually impaired. There were actually two men who were visually impaired. Now, the reason perhaps that Mark and Luke only tell us about the one man is possibly because the one man spoke more loudly than the other man, or perhaps that one man was more well known in the community than the other man was. Matter of fact, when you read Mark's account, Mark gives us the man's name. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 46 through verse 47, it reads this way. They spent some time in Jericho. As Jesus was leaving town, trailed by his disciples, a parade of people, a blind beggar by the name of Bar Timaeus, son of Timaeus. Whenever you find a name with bar as the prefix in scriptures, bar always means son of. Uh, Simon is referred to as Simon bar Jonah. It literally means Simon, son of Jonah. Uh, Bartholomew is referred to by that name bar Tholomew, literally means son of Talmai. So according to verse 46 of Mark chapter 10, 
one out of these two visually impaired men, his name uh, was Bar Timaeus or son of Timaeus. Uh, that's what you find in verse 46. Verse 47 says, when he heard that Jesus the Nazarene was passing by, he began to cry out, son of David, Jesus, mercy, have mercy on me. This record that is found in Matthew 20, Mark chapter 10, and Luke chapter 18, it is so absolutely and utterly mesmerizing until I didn't want to mess this up. So in preparation this week, I sent a direct message all the way to heaven. I said, uh, uh, Lord, can you send one of these dudes to the faith church on fourth Sunday uh, to talk to the faith church congregation? And the Lord say, I can send them which one of them you want me to send. I said, well, go ahead and send that dude that Mark talked about. Go, 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 go ahead and send the son of Timaeus, Bar Timaeus. We want to hear from Bar Timaeus on Sunday morning at the faith church. And Jesus said, will? Because, <laughs> you know, Jesus don't need whole long sentences to explain uh, things. He said, will? I will send Bar Timaeus to come to the faith church to help you understand this utterly and absolutely mesmerizing miracle. Bartimaeus, or son of Timaeus, breaks his comments into three separate and distinct pieces. I want to share those pieces with you, me and Bartimaeus, this morning. I want to break this into three separate and distinct pieces pieces to help you to understand this miracle, perhaps in ways that you have never understood it before. Uh, Bartimaeus says, Thorpe, thank you for having me at the faith church. He said, I've been hanging out up here with Jesus, God, the angels, David, Paul, Silas. I understand all of their testimonies. Thought I understand that Paul and Silas prayed at midnight and the Lord shook the jail they were in. All of their bands fell off and they had a hallelujah good time. Uh, thought I'm up here with David and David has been telling me about the times that he would play his harp and the heart of King Saul would be soon. Uh, Thought I'm up here with Nehemiah who's telling me about all the walls that he was able to successfully build. And thought I don't mind being up here with David, Paul, and Silas, and Nehemiah, but you got some people down there in Gainesville who got some testimonies too. You got some people in the faith church who can testify that can't nobody do you like Jesus. Can't nobody do you like the Lord. Somebody can testify that he healed your body and told you to run on. Somebody else can testify he picked me up and he turned me all around. Thorpe, you all have some testimonies too. So Bartimaeus says, while I enjoy being in heaven, I am thankful to take a field trip down to Gainesville to spend some time with the saints at the faith church. And thought there are three things that I want to share with your congregation and with those who are watching from home. Three warnings or admonitions that I want to give to them. Thought here is the first one. Thought, tell the people at Faith Church that when they look at my record in Matthew chapter 20, Mark chapter 10, and in Luke chapter 18, thought, tell the people I'm more than I look like. I'm more than I look like. Oh. Uh, Bartimaeus, uh, can you be more specific? He said, if you can read, I'll be as specific as you want me to be. I said, well, let me work on this reading thing. He said, thought, read verse 35. All right, Bartimaeus, maybe I'll call him Bart for short. All right, Bart, verse 35. He, speaking of Jesus, came to the outskirts of Jericho. A blind man was sitting beside the road asking for handouts. 
Now, some of us, the moment we read that, we form opinions about this man, that he is a blind beggar on the side of the road asking for handouts. But God sent me by here this morning to warn you, people are not always what we look like. And I don't know who it is in here today who has been looking down on someone because you judge them based on what they look like. Oh, this is free. Some of us have been looking at people not too low. We've been looking at some other people too high and have placed them on a pedestal based on what they look like. But Bartimaeus says, Thorpe, I need you to warn the saints that I am more than I look like. Thorpe, you read 35, you see me on the side of the road, you see me begging, but Thorpe, watch me in verse 40 and verse 41. The Bible says, when Jesus heard me, verse 40 says, Jesus stopped and ordered me to be brought over. When I came near, Jesus said to me, what do you want from me? Thought. All the people who were around, were they were already mad at me because I was hollering so much. But now thought, the people are looking at Jesus funny. Are y'all that deep? <laughs> Bro, Harry, y'all missed this already? Okay, let me, let, me, let me go over it again. Verse 35, the man is described as a blind beggar on the side of the road. Bro, BJ, me, you, the baby, and Dwan, we gonna get this. Everybody else is struggling. The man is on the side of the road, blind, and begging. The fact that he is on the side of the road and he is blind means that he did not place himself on the side of the road. They had a custom in that day that either a family member, a friend, or a neighbor would take the man daily and because remember there were two of them, they would position them on a roadside where people passing by, they would shake a cup. Hey, they would prime the cup before they shook it. Y'all didn't come to have church. They, they would have a metal cup. They would take coins and put coins in the cup to prime the cup. So that when they shook the cup, the cup made noise. And when other people heard the cup shaking and the coins rattling, they would be tempted to put more money in the cup. The reason the crowd got mad at the man in the first place is because they made the assumption that what he had been asking for is what he was going to keep on asking for. He's begging, shaking a cup on the side of the road. The inference would be he wanted Jesus to put something in the cup. However, when Jesus called for the man, Jesus didn't say to the man, how much do you need? Jesus said to the man, what do you want from me? I'll show you in a moment that Jesus could tell by the way the man addressed him that he wanted more then than he had wanted before. Y'all didn't come to get this. When he showed up that morning, Minister Jones, all he had on his mind was getting more money in his cup. But when he heard that Jesus was passing by, he shifted his expectations and said, I know what y'all are used to me asking for, but that ain't what I'm asking for today. And watch this. The people didn't understand, but Jesus did. 
You know the problem with a whole lot of us? Some of us been down so low until the people around us are comfortable with our downness. But what they don't recognize is at any given moment, Jesus can turn your situation around. And what I've been is no longer what I am. So Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? You've been out here asking for money. Be specific. Do you want more money? The man says, not today. He said, all I wanted before was money because the people who were passing by, that's all they could give me. But when I heard that Jesus was in town, I want more than what I've ever asked for. Who am I talking to in here today? You need to shift your expectations. You need to raise the level of your expectations. You need to stop asking God for the crumbs and beg him for the whole meal. You need to stop asking him for what's on the bottom and ask him for what comes from the top. Hey, let me break it into some smaller pieces so you can take it with you wherever you're going to eat after service is over. Bartimaeus, can you be more specific when you tell us that you are more than you look like? Can you be more specific? He says, Thorpe, I'll do the best I can. Thorpe, first of all, tell the people, I am more than my reputation. In verse 35, my reputation was I begged on the side of the road. Uh, Minister Ralph, if you read Mark chapter 10 and verse 46 in the King James Version, I'm not going to say that the King James Version made a mistake, but they do use a rather misleading statement. When you read Mark chapter 10 and verse 46 in the King James Version, you know how this man is referred to. He is not referred to as he is in most modern translations. In most modern translations, the Bible said that he was a blind man on the side of the road begging. Mark 10 and 46 in the King James Version doesn't describe him. It gives him a name. The name that he is given in the King James Version is blind Bartimaeus. As if. Calling me blind Bartimaeus limits me that I've never been anything before blind Bartimaeus and I'll never be anything after blind Bartimaeus. The problem with a whole lot of us in here this morning and watching from home, we're answering to old names. Broke Ray. Single Suzanne. What I am going through doesn't necessarily define who I am. Locked up, James. That, that might be my situation and I'm getting ahead of myself, but that doesn't have to always be my situation. The man says, I am more than my reputation. All they thought about me is that I was a blind man on the side of the road begging. But if they really knew my whole story, they would know that there is more to me than what you see. He says, I'm more than my reputation. Hey, but then he says, thought, I'm more than my reservations. I'm more than my reputation, but I'm more than my Reservations. Watch Luke chapter 18 beginning in verse 36. The Bible says when he, speaking of the blind man, heard the rustle of the crowd, he asked what was going on. Hey, he's blind. He is visually impaired. And I don't know if you know much about people who are visually impaired. But whenever one of your senses is limited, your other senses become heightened. He couldn't see, but he could hear real good. Y'all didn't come to have church. And sometimes we're so busy focusing only on what we don't have until we don't learn how to celebrate 
what we do have. Man said, I'm blind, true, but let's perform a hearing test. You can see better than I can, but I can hear some stuff you ain't never heard. And the man says in verse 36 that he heard the rustle of the crowd. That means that the noise of this crowd meant that it was different from any other crowd that had passed by before. When he heard the rustle in verse 36, he asked what was going on. On. Watch what they tell him. They told him Jesus the Nazarene is going by. He yelled. Jesus, son of David, mercy, have mercy on me. How loudly did he yell? Watch verse 39. Those ahead of Jesus told the man, shut up. But he only yelled all the louder. Son of David, Mercy, have mercy on me. And watch Jesus' response in the first statement in verse 40. Jesus stopped and ordered him to be brought over. This text means that he moved beyond whatever reservations he had. Okay, okay, can I say it plainly? Cute prayers are reserved for cute problems. But radical prayers are reserved for radical problems. And the reason perhaps your deliverance has not showed up to your address is because you got a radical problem, but your prayer is too cute. And if you need a radical solution, maybe you need to pray some radical prayers. Some of us ain't never going to get nothing from God as quiet as we be. These prayers you praying? Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord. My, you ain't going to get nothing from God like that. Uh, when Peter got ready to walk on water, he used 13 words to ask Jesus' permission. But when he started sinking, he took 10 of them back and used three and said, Lord, save me. Sometimes you got to get outside of your comfort zone and make some noise. And don't tell me, uh, Pastor, or not even Pastor, Pastor, you don't understand the nature of my makeup. My personality is calm and reserved. Till you get to the gate again. Don't tell me I've been. And people ordinarily don't make no noise at all. Get at a sporting event and make all kind of noise. Be sitting in here and let me tell you somebody ran into your car. You'll make all kind of noise. Let me paint it this way. Let me say to some wife in here, there's somebody out there bothering your husband. Let me say to some wife in here, somebody out there, uh, somebody say to some husband, somebody out there, out there bothering your wife. And you said it all. Oh, I didn't hit your nerve yet. Let me say to some mama in here, there's somebody bothering your kids. You'll tear this whole place up. Which means don't go around talking about how calm and quiet you are. You may be calm and quiet under certain circumstances, but when the right nerve is struck, you will come outside of your comfort zones. You will get beyond your reservation and you will make some noise. Minister Lawson, it is absolutely undeniable in this text that the only reason Jesus took note of the man is because of the amount of noise that the man made. And could it be the reason he hadn't showed up yet at your address is because you're so cute with your prayer life. Oh, Father, dear Lord up above in heaven, please look down upon your humble servant, Jesus, and grant the request that I have laid at thy feet. Let pressure get on you heavy enough. You'll get outside of all that cuteness, and you will break that thing down and lay aside all of your reservations. 
This man said, I'm more than my reputation. I'm more than my reservations. But then in verse 40 through verse 42, the man teaches, I'm more than my current situation. Because again, the, the, the main point I'm trying to get you to see is that I'm more than I look like. Watch verse 40. Jesus stopped and ordered him to be brought over. When he came near, Jesus asked, what do you want from me? Watch the man's response. Because some of y'all miss this. I'll be honest. Uh, Dean Kenny, I'll be honest. I've been missing this for years. Been preaching for decades, teaching for decades. I missed this for years. Watch verse 41. The man did not say, I want to see. The man said, I want to see again. That means I ain't always been blind. Huh. And the reason you need to stop judging me the way you judge me is because I'm more than my reputation. I'm more than my reservations, but I'm more than my current situations. You used to looking down on me, but I ain't been down always. And let me warn somebody in here. Maybe you've been down for the last couple of years, but you need to remind yourself where you came from. Because at, at a minimum, wherever you came from is where you can go back to. I ain't always been like this. Hey, usually in church, all we try to tell people is, you won't always be like this. But sometimes we need to remember that I ain't always been like this. That I know what it's like to be blessed because the Lord has blessed me before. I know what it's like to be up because before I was down, I was up. Stop judging people based on their, because all they saw was blind Bartimaeus, according to the King James Version. All they saw was blind Bartimaeus on the side of the road shaking his cup with coins asking for money. But Bartimaeus says, if you check my resume, I ain't always been like this. I ain't always been a beggar on the side of the road. They didn't have social services in that day. He was obviously limited with what his family could do for him. The only recourse for those who were visually impaired was to be placed on the roadside and to beg for resources from those who pass by. The man is saying, I don't like where I am and I ain't always been where I am and stop looking down on me before you trade places with me. So Bartimaeus says, tell the people I'm more than I look like. Oh, I am not my current situation. Hey, watch verse 41 and verse 42. Oh, uh, if you go back to verse 39, when the man is first given the opportunity to cry out, after they tell him to shut up, watch verse 39, those ahead of Jesus told the man to shut up, but he only yelled all the louder. What did he say? Son of David, mercy, have mercy on me. Hey. Notice what he didn't ask for. He didn't say, give me justice. You don't want that. We beg for it in Tallahassee, D.C., and downtown at the county administration building, the school board administration building, the city administration building. You demand justice in the public square, but don't ever go to God and ask him for justice. Because if God handed out justice to you, all of us would have been cut off a long time ago. He didn't say, God, give me justice. He didn't say, God, give me equity. He didn't say, God, give me fairness. He said, Lord, have mercy on me. 
That word mercy is the Greek word eleison. It literally means to either ask for pity or to ask for mercy to be extended. And this man was asking for either one of the two. He was either asking for Jesus to take pity on him or asking Jesus to show mercy towards him. The crowd thought that all he was asking for was pity. The crowd felt, this part of your printed outline, that mercy was on his mind. Crowd said the fact that he is asking Jesus to take pity on him. The crowd says all we have ever heard him do was to ask people to have pity on a poor blind beggar. And they assumed that what he was asking for now is what he had been asking for. They assumed that mercy was on his mind. But let me see if I can push it a step further and perhaps cause you to look at this through a different set of lenses. Perhaps it was not only true that mercy was on his mind, perhaps it was true that mercy fit his case. Okay, I guess you didn't come to be as deep as I did. Um, verse 41, Jesus said, what do you want from me? What do you want? want from me here's his response he said master i want to see again deacon reggie the question becomes what happened to his sight in the first place because it can very well be that the reason he is asking jesus for mercy, Greek word eleison, is because mercy not only means pity, but mercy also means a request for the extension of mercy. Okay, maybe you don't understand what mercy is. Grace is when God gives you what you do not deserve. If I walked in here today and Minister Doug handed me an envelope full of cash, this thick, an envelope full of cash. If I walked in here today and Minister Doug handed me an envelope full of cash, this thick, that's uh, four and a half or four and three quarter inches, Minister Doug. An envelope, you take a good size envelope, four and three quarter inches of cash. It can be all ones, be all fives, Tens, twenties, fifties, hundreds. Y'all ain't caught it yet. I'm making a recommendation to Minister Doug that next Sunday when you <laughs> next Sunday when you come. But if Minister Doug walked in, envelope four and three, three quarter inches thick, and handed it to me and said, "Thought." You and first lady to be, use this however you please. That's grace. He gave me what I did not deserve. Here's mercy. Minister Doug is also in law enforcement. Let's say I'm riding through the city of Gainesville, and for whatever reason, I'm doing 55 in a 35. Minister Doug pulls me over. And says, Pastor Thorpe, where are you headed in such a hurry? And I say to him, Minister Doug, not just because we know each other, and I sure don't want to get you in no trouble, but Minister Doug, please have mercy on me. Grace is when he gave me what I did not deserve. Mercy is when I ask him not to give me what I do deserve. I deserve a citation. I deserve a court date. I deserve points on my license. I deserve for my insurance premium to go up. But I am asking him to have mercy on me and to take away what my wrong has earned me. 
And it could very well be that the reason this man is blind now is because of some wrong that he committed and the Lord put blindness on him. So it could be not only that mercy was on his mind, but that mercy suited his case. And the man cried out to Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And I don't know who I'm talking to today who's watching from home or in the building. Maybe you got mercy on your mind, but maybe mercy fits your case. Amen. Maybe somebody needs to apologize to Jesus this morning to get something off of you that your sin put on you. My beloved pastor, Reverend Dr. David A. Lattimore Jr., I saw him on yesterday. I also saw his two oldest children. Something very unique about his oldest child, it's his daughter. When she was born, she was stricken with a terrible illness that doctors could not diagnose. The doctors could not diagnose her illness that kept her hospital bound, but her daddy could. Her daddy knew that the only reason his daughter was sick is because God had commanded him to preach and he was on the run. Recognizing that the sickness in his daughter was caused by his own disobedience, he cried out to God and released his will for God's will and agreed to preach the gospel. His daughter's healing was so miraculous at that moment until it gained local news coverage. Because sometimes what you in is what your sin has gotten you into. And you need to ask God to have mercy on you to take off what your sin may have put on. This man says, Thorpe, tell the people I am more than I look like. He said, Thorpe, but tell them uh, at least two more things. Here's the second one. Some say, Thorpe better hurry up because he got two more. They go, I'm good, I'm good, I'm cool, I'm cool. Uh, t t t tell them I'm more than I look like, but thought I want you to also tell them that he is more than he looks like. Thought, who are you talking about? Or Bartimaeus, who are you talking about? Who's the he you talking about? Bart? Thought, I'm talking about Jesus. Because when I asked them who was passing by, in verse 35 and verse 36, they told me that it was Jesus the Nazarene. Verse 37, they told him, Jesus the Nazarene is going by. But thought, notice that when I started yelling in verse 38, I ain't said nothing about no Nazarene. Nazareth was his boyhood home. <laughs> thought, he didn't get to Nazareth until he was a little boy. Thought, I didn't call Jesus by his new name. I called him by his pre-existent and his eternal name. Thought, I wasn't calling on the New Testament Jesus. I was calling on the Old Testament Jesus. Thought, I was not calling on the baby born in Bethlehem. I was calling on the one that Micah testified about thousands of years before he was born that he would be born in Bethlehem. Thought, I was not talking to Jesus of Nazareth. I was talking to the pre-existent Jesus from Isaiah 53 where Isaiah said he would be wounded for my transgressions. He would be bruised for my iniquity. The chastisement of my peace would be upon him. But with his stripes, I would be healed. He says, so watch me, Thought in 38. They told me in 37 it was Jesus of Nazareth. But when I cried in 38, I said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And as Jesus was going through the crowd and heard that man yelling out his government name, 
Because you do know the Old Testament said, and the government shall be up. Y'all didn't read your Bible before you came to church. The government shall be upon his shoulder. Jesus said, beg your pardon? Everybody else is calling me Jesus the Nazarite or Jesus from Nazareth. But you reach beyond where I am all the way to who I have always been. And you referred to me by my priestly name. That you are the son of David. What Bartimaeus was saying was the Messiah we've been waiting on, you it. And I acknowledge who you are, all that you have come to be, and all that the scriptures have told me you can perform. And perhaps your problem is you only understand a church version of Jesus but he more than that. That's why Sister Jackson, with all that I have in me as the pastor of this local church, I commit myself on a regular basis to help you read and understand the Bible for yourself because Jesus is more than your Sunday morning fix. There is so much in him. You so busy waiting on him uh, f to, to work one way when he has so many different ways he can work. We have the record in the New Testament of Jesus performing miracles by touching people. We have the record of Jesus performing miracles by speaking words over people. We have the record of Jesus spitting on the ground and taking clay, forming a paste and wiping it on the eyes of those who were blind. We also have the record of Jesus spitting in people's faces to remove their blindness. We have the record of Jesus by virtue of his will converting water into wine. We also have the record of Jesus not touching somebody but somebody touching him. Because a woman with an issue of blood crawled on her hands and knees and touched the H-E-M on the H-I-M. And power left out of H-I-M went into the H-E-M and healed the H-E-R. Y'all didn't come to get this. I'm preaching way better than y'all saying amen. I'm going to give my own self a raise. Where's the board of directors? I'm giving my... <laughs> I'm going to be a millionaire by the time service is over. He can do whatever he wants to whenever he gets ready and he can work all kinds of different ways. Thought, what are you getting at? He is more than he looks like. All they saw was Jesus of Nazareth. This man saw Jesus, son of David, who's the one who has the power to forgive sin and to bring about restoration. All right, lest I hold you too long. Bartimaeus says, Thorpe, I got three things I want to testify to this morning. The first one is, I'm more than I look like. The second one is, he's more than he looks like. Thorpe, here's number three that I want you to share with the people. You are more than you look like. Yeah, yeah. Thorpe, is it in the text? Bart, I see it. I see it, Bart. Thank you, Bart, for walking me, to, walking me through 39 or 35 through 38. Thank you, Bart. Thank you, Bart. Thank you, Bart. But Bart, now that we're in 39, Bart, let me show you something. Not about you, Bart, but about us. Verse 35, the blind man named Bartimaeus is on the side of the road as he was daily, shaking a cup with coins in it, asking for money. He hears a crowd coming by. The crowd sounds differently from the way it normally sounds. And Bartimaeus asks the crowd, what's different? The crowd says, Jesus the Nazarene is coming by. And Bartimaeus immediately begins to cry out in verse 38, Jesus, son of David, mercy have mercy on me. Now watch 39. Those ahead of Jesus told the man to shut up. Now why did they tell the man to shut up? They told him to shut up because they didn't think he was any more than what they had previously thought 
he was. They thought he was going to be bothering Jesus. They thought all he was going to do was ask Jesus for, well, but hold on. I'm blind. I'm broke. I'm begging. Why wouldn't I ask Jesus for some money? What they didn't know was he had been asking for money, but money was not what he was about to ask for. So verse 39, they tell him to shut up, but what does he do? He only yelled all the louder, son of David, mercy, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered him to be brought over. When he had come near, Jesus asked. Now, when you read this in some of the other gospel accounts, they said to the man, Message Bible says, it's your lucky day. Jesus wants to see you. All right? Says, so Mary, you're my problem now. You're my problem. While ago, y'all told me, shut up. But now that you see that I've caught Jesus' attention, instead of scolding me, you are congratulating me. Verse 41, Jesus says, what do you want from me? He said, Master, I want to see again. Jesus said, go ahead, see again. Your faith has saved and healed you. The healing was instant. He looked up, seeing. Then followed Jesus, glorifying God. And this last statement is where I've been trying to get. Everyone in the street joined in, shouting, praise to God. Hold on, Sister Holcomb. Hold on. Everybody? Hold on now. You mean tell me everybody was rejoicing? Yeah, everybody. Bartimaeus. Was everybody rejoicing? Bart said, thought the whole crowd was rejoicing. Bart, was it the same crowd who was present in 35? He said, yeah, it was the same crowd. Bart, the same people who thought you were nothing more than a beggar and thought that Jesus was nothing more than a Nazarite, they for shouting. Yeah, I thought it was the same crowd. Hold on, Bart. Same crowd who thought you were a beggar. Jesus was only a Nazarene. But the same crowd that told you to shut up. They were rejoicing. Yeah, I thought it was the same crowd. Bart, what did you do? He said, well, I thought part of my flesh wanted to cut him. Part of my flesh thought wanted to drop a Mike Jones spirit on him. And said, when I was broke, y'all didn't want me. And now I'm hot. Y'all all on me. But thought, I got out of the flesh and got in the spirit. And I started thanking God for second chances. Hmm. Y'all ain't ready for this. He says, thought it would have been hard for me to celebrate my second chance without giving them hypocrites a second chance also. Because thought they told me to shut up in the early verses, but they're rejoicing with me now. And the problem with a whole lot of us, we so stuck on what people used to be until we don't give Jesus any credit for changing people. Now here's the news flash. We want him to change us. We just don't want to believe he can change other people. And God's word to somebody today is, not only is it true that I'm more than you see and that he is more than you see, you also are more 
than you see. You are more than you look like. Thorpe, can you make it plain? Yes. Thank God that all good pencils have erasers. <laughs> I'm glad that God gives second chances. One day God told Abraham and Sarah, y'all going to have a child. And both of them on two separate occasions laughed. But God gave them a second chance. And he produced Isaac. One day, y'all ain't gonna like this, but I got to say it like the words say. One day, there was a hooker in Jericho named Rahab. All y'all wanna talk about in y'all family is your nephew who went to fam, your niece who graduated from UF, your cousin at USF. Why you don't want to talk about none of the poll workers in your family? Why, why you don't never want to? You quick to bring up your uncle who went to Penn State but don't want to say nothing about your nephew who's in the state pen. <laughs> But when Jesus gives his family history, there's a hooker from Jericho named Rahab. And it was because of Rahab that the spies in Jericho were delivered and God's people were able to take the city. Why? Because God gives second chances. David, I see you playing your heart for King Saul. But I also see, also see you taking another man's wife and having that man executed. He said, yeah, Thorpe, you see me while I'm down, but the Lord gave me another chance. Because I cried out to him one day and said, create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. God gave me another chance. Come here, Jonah. The Lord told you to go down to Nineveh and preach to the people, but because of what they had done to your relatives, you went in the opposite direction. God dispatched a whale. They threw you overboard. The whale swallowed you, stayed in there for three days and three nights, but then God touched you, made you sick of the whale, then touched the whale and made the whale sick of you, and the whale vomited you out on dry ground. But then the Bible says the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. That means God gave him another chance. The Bible says it was a three-day journey into Nineveh, but Jonah, Jonah made it in one solid day because the Lord gave him another chance. Come here, Peter. You testified when Jesus said, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And somebody in the crowd said, you that prophet that Moses talked about in the book of Numbers. Then Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. But my father who is in heaven. In the next verses, Jesus said, I got to go to the cross. And Peter rebuked him. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You're minding only earthly things instead of heavenly things. Peter said, Lord, all these other disciples will leave you, but I will never leave you. Jesus said, Be before the rooster crows twice tonight, you would have denied knowing me three times. And Peter, warming his hands by the enemy's fire, denied that he even knew the Lord when he got done denying him. Cockle doodle doo. The rooster crowed. He looked up and saw Jesus. And the Bible says he wept bitterly. But when Jesus got resurrected from the grave, you know what Jesus said to the women who came to visit him? Tell my disciples and Peter that I want to meet them in Galilee. See, Peter needed to hear that Jesus called him by name. Because Peter had flunked on Jesus so bad 
until he felt that he would no longer be of use and service to the master. But ain't you glad that all good pencils got erasers? Jesus came and found Peter and said, Peter, I'm going to establish you and make you the leader of the first century church. And when you get to Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached one sermon and 3,000 souls got saved at the same time. Why? Because the Lord gave him another chance. And somebody in here this morning, you ought to have your own testimony. Somebody at home, you ought to have your own testimony that you failed, you flunk, you had fallen, but the Lord gave you. Y'all didn't come to have church. We could stand. Y'all, y'all didn't come for this. Y'all didn't come for this. I'll be a witness that sometimes life looks like it is passing you by. But I can testify that the Lord will give you another chance. Thank God that all good pencils got erasers. And I'm glad that for every one of my mess ups, he can fix me up. For every one of my downs, he can raise me up. For every midweek crucifixion, there's a Sunday morning resurrection. And somebody in here today, you may have been down, but you can get up this morning. All good pencils got erasers. The Lord will give you another chance. All heads are bowed, all eyes are closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, we don't understand everything, but we understand enough. We understand that you are more and you can do more than we could even ask or think. Thank you for the love that you have for us and the ways that you express that love through both your grace and your mercy. Forgive us for where we have gone wrong. Restore us to places of fellowship. Do for us just what you did for that blind man, those two men who sat on the side of the road begging, but when they heard that it was you coming by, they altered their requests and cried out for mercy, not for pity, but for you to lift the weight off of them that their wrong may have put on them. Lord, help us to be the same. Then, Lord, change us as members of your body. Change us so that we will stop judging people based on what we see. That we would stop judging you based on our limited understanding. But that we would even extend some grace to ourselves to recognize that you're able to give us a second or another chance. I pray, Lord, for those who do not have a relationship with you. I pray, Lord, for those who have never said yes to you that today would be the day that they tell you yes. Lord, I pray for every person who is watching at home who needs a personal relationship with you. Have them write us in the comments. Send us a direct message. We'll pray with them. We'll pray for them. I pray, Lord, for those in this building that as counselors come, we will be able to receive them as they give their hearts and their lives to you. Bless us as we give knowing that our gifts are used for the upbuilding of your kingdom. Then bless us as we go. Watch over us, guide us, protect us, hold us in the palm of your hand. We claim it done even now in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give God a rousing round of applause. Shout out one time, Lord, have mercy on me. One more time, Lord, have mercy. On me, you got one more in you, Lord, have mercy on me.